And the next boom, which I have subtitled what you absolutely, positively have to know about the world between now and 2025. And the reason I say that is because there's an extremely important and powerful set of trends that are coming together to ignite the future growth of the world, the future economic growth of the world. You absolutely have to know about these things no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're an investor, whether you're in a career, whether you're in academia or government, these are things you need to know about. And we're going to highlight a lot of these things today. I don't have time to cover all of them, but you're going to get some really incredible facts out of this and see how things weave together in a really interesting way. So by 1950, the year I was born, people were astonished to wake up one morning and read the news that the world population was estimated to have topped two and a half billion people. And people went, oh my God, what are we going to do with all these people? How are we going to feed them? How are we going to create jobs for them? How are we going to deal with this? But as you can see here, that was really just a down payment because by 1980, we had what? Four billion people? Somewhere around the beginning of this year, we ticked over to seven billion people by 2050 will be at 9 billion people. Using a pretty simple measure, today the global middle class is already 2 billion people out of a global population of 7 billion. But look at how fast it's going to grow. 20 years from now, we're talking about 5 billion people. 5 billion people somewhere in the consumer class, able to make discretionary purchases. The business opportunities that that will create are absolutely phenomenal. For our purposes and purposes of discussing the growing global middle class. Let's define it simply as having enough money to make discretionary purchases. So having enough money to buy things beyond the bare necessities of life. So that might mean being able to buy not only plenty of food, but packaged food for the first time. Maybe taking your family out to a restaurant to eat every once in a while. It might mean moving ahead from walking or riding on a donkey or riding in a goat cart to getting a motor scooter. This is another good scene. This is from a very busy corner in downtown Shanghai. So this is a street that was once a street for cars and now they've blocked it off so that only people can get on it. And I have no idea. It seems like there must be a couple of million people walking down this road every day. It's just immensely crowded. And here on this prominent corner, you can see the Hershey's logo. Hershey's is doing great in China. If you think about it, a piece of chocolate every once in a while is a great affordable little luxury for people who are just moving up into the middle class. Makes sense. On the bottom right, you'll see the KFC logo. See the kernel there? So this is a pretty typical corner in China, in a big city. On any given corner, you'll find a KFC and McDonald's and a Starbucks. It's doing huge. And it, it, just, it just shows you what a small world it is and how many opportunities there are. In fact, this is a list of things at Plunkett Research we think are really powerful opportunities for multinational companies. Financial services, sports and entertainment in China, in fact, close to those pictures I just showed you, in uh, downtown in the big cities are giant the National Basketball Association, NBA stores, huge, with giant color posters of American basketball stars and people lined up to get in and buy NBA logo merchandise. Uh, I can also tell you last year, three of the top four movies in China, top grossing movies in China at the box office were American films. So entertainment, sports, big opportunities, healthcare products, food products, by the way, travel and tourism. I'm not saying it's easy to get established doing business there. We're doing a little business there ourselves and it has not been easy. It, we're doing business in India, it has not been easy, but I can tell you the opportunities are there. Again, if you go back to the late 1940s, 1950, and look at the phenomenal growth in the global population we've just looked at, the way we've managed to deal with the needs and concerns and challenges of those people in a reasonably good fashion, considering how big the challenge was, was through the application of advanced technologies. And the three biggest technologies for the near future, I think, are biotechnology, nanotechnology, and a unique area of the wireless business called remote wireless sensors. The United States has a clear leadership position in the world in these three vital technologies, no matter how you measure it, by number of patents applied for, by number of journal articles published, by amount of money invested in research and development. The United States has a clear lead, but the rest of the world is chasing America hard and fast in these areas. It's up to the United States to try to stay dominant and to capitalize on what we've got. That technology progress this century will be 200 times what it was in the last century. I think he's not only right, I think it might understate how fast 
things are going to happen and are happening right now as we're talking. And I want to give you a couple of concrete examples. This was my first portable computer. The year is 1983. I paid $2,500 for it in 1983 money. I wrote my first book on it, by the way. Uh, they called it a portable, but it had no batteries and it weighed 25 pounds, so I didn't exactly lug it to the coffee shop. It had no hard drive. Storage was on miserable little five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Anybody remember those? They're terrible. Okay, here's my favorite example. I'm not making this up. This is my first mobile phone. The year is 1968. I was an 18-year-old smart aleck entrepreneur who thought I had to be able to carry a telephone around everywhere I went. So I bought this. It cost $2,500 in 1968 money, a small fortune. It was made by a division of SCM called Me Labs in Palo Alto, California. It weighed 18 pounds. It did have batteries. It had eight huge batteries in it that would power the thing for about two hours. It would make a reasonably good phone call, but to make a call, I frequently had to push one of these buttons to select a channel and then try to get an operator's attention to finish a call for me, make the connection for me. By the way, I could hear everybody else's conversation while I was waiting for the channel to clear, and that was pretty interesting. Um, I thought it was cool. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I won't say it changed my life, but it did a lot. I really, really got a lot of use out of it. But imagine if you had come back and visited me as a time traveler and sat at my desk when I opened this thing and made my first phone call and said, Jack, that's pretty cool. But look at what's going to happen in the near future. And you would pulled your iPhone 4 out of your pocket and shown me what it will do. I would have been speechless. It wouldn't have seemed possible. And that is just how dramatically and even faster and to a greater extent technology is about to change the way we live, the way we do business, the way we trade, the way we do finances. Don't lose sight of that. If there's anything I want you to leave here today thinking about, it's that.